welcome to the Ghost of Harren Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 217 of our chapter-by-chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 73 of A Storm of Swords, that's John 10. And as always, we'll chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. And hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment along the way. We'll summarise what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes that provide some additional information about the characters and other things of note in this chapter. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing just fine. Getting uh, getting ready for the, the holiday here. Yes, we're we, on... we have Thanksgiving in America, which is which is a very nice holiday. It's one of my, one of my favorite American holidays because it's, I mean, okay, it's got a nasty backstory, but let's let's brush over that sure, in favor sure. of the fact that people take the opportunity to sort of be with family and also to think of reasons to be thankful, which is always a good thing to do. Quite, quite. So I, I approve of this. I approve of this particular holiday. Uh, we Molly and I uh, were at. Dairy Queen last night. Dairy Queen is a uh, a place where you get ice cream here in the states. I don't know. I don't know how how far and wide Dairy Queen <laughs> extends. But uh, she told the person behind the counter, "Stay blessed." When they, they said, "Have a happy Thanksgiving," and she said, "Stay blessed." And we were walking out, and I said, "How do you know she's blessed in the first place?" And she said, "She's alive, Dad. She's blessed with her life." And I was like, "Oh, wow." Wow. Make me feel like an idiot. Uh-huh. <laughs> but she, so uh, yeah, I guess the point is you you need to give. Uh, it, it's always good to give thanks for things such as well, simply being alive. Apparently, <laughs> and and the opportunity to serve Molly. I mean, right? Really, most yes. would kill for this. <laughs> A blizzard upside down. You know, they have to tilt it, <laughs> turn it upside down before they hand it to you. Oh, uh, to prove that it won't slide out, right? Yes. That's the... I don't yes. see the point. I, what, I don't what either. is the appeal? I don't know. Does that know. mean it's very cold or thick? I guess I don't. Oh, There's a little thick. sign next to the register that says, "If it's not served to you upside down, it's free." So, it's really important to them to serve it to you upside down. I just don't understand why. So, I have a I have a couple of interesting little stories for you. Actually, I, um, I love when you do. You, as do our you listeners. Know I save them up. Um. I was talking to a friend of mine whose son has just become a father. Okay, yes. And we were in quite a big group. And this person said, yeah, I still can't get my head around the fact that I'm technically a grandmother. And I said, I'm not sure you need the word technically. (laughs) (laughs) Why technically? (laughs) I feel like you're intentionally distancing yourself from something that you actually are. (laughs) Uh, later on, it it was a teams meeting, and later she put a photo of the baby who was absolutely adorable. And uh-huh. somebody was late to the meeting and came in and said, "Oh, is is that the grandbaby?" And I said, "Technically, technically speaking." <laughs> and this this same person was telling me that um, the she herself has two sons. Uh, one of them is the new father, and the other one isn't. I mean, okay, kind of goes. Because uh-huh. what I'm saying, kind of thing. But one of the two sons had um, attention deficit disorder and was given meds for it when he was a child. All right. And one day, she didn't explain why this happened, but one day she gave the med to the wrong child oh. and sent them off to school. <laughs> <laughs> and the child who didn't have ADD called her in the middle of the day and said, Mom, I have got to get this stuff. <laughs> I am crushing it at school today. <laughs> I think it has the opposite effect if you don't need it, right? Well, apparently he was like, man, I am focusing on everything. Oh. I'm understanding everything. So possibly he, he was undiagnosed himself, but it <laughs> cracked me up that he was just like, whoa, <laughs> this kid's got it going on. It's like the first time that, you know, you put on glasses when you need glasses and you've been holding off on oh, getting glasses. Yeah. Whoa. I, I don't wear glasses, but I know I need glasses. So I'll let you know how that feeling uh, is whenever is. I finally Very break soon. down. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I told you my theory about that. My theory is my theory is it sort of countervailing to the modern, not modern, but to sort of like generally held opinions. Glasses often bestow a, an appearance of intelligence on people. Right, sure, um, yeah. But my my experience of getting glasses, which I did when I was about 30, 
uh, was that it, they made me stupider. Okay, do tell. Explain. Um, where we live, again, I don't know if this is common around the world, but the, the road signs, particularly the road labels, so when you're going past a side street, there's a sign that says what the name of the side street is, is green with white writing. Right. Without my glasses, it is impossible to read those. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Unless okay. I squint and use my staggering intellect to interpret those hieroglyphics, uh. I can't read them without glasses. Glasses. Okay, you're doing less the work I, now. <laughs> the day I got my glasses, my brain went, oh, oh, oh you don't need me anymore. <laughs> I'm just going to take the time off here. <laughs> exactly. I've been just a little bit dumber ever since. I've never <laughs> quite recovered from that moment. Oh, that's funny. I'd never thought about it that way. Well, it's in your near future. I guess so. I had lunch today with an English guy called Simon. Oh, that's who, confusing. Uh, who's my age, has an American wife and a 20-year-old son. I, I think you've mentioned this guy before. Yeah, I had lunch with him today and it just, it got weirder and weirder. Like he was talking about, what is it with my American family? They can't turn off a light. I'm like, yes! <laughs> and they don't know how to stick shift. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> and Roger Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> no, he did not mention Roger Palmer. He didn't? Oh, okay. My, my sister Sarah got into her car and she, um, this story is not funny by itself. It's just the way my sister told it made it quite funny because <laughs> she, she unraveled this story in a very particular way, leading to sort of quite a lot of humor. So she got in her car and she sensed that something was wrong. The glove compartment had been opened some of her can she keeps like a bag of sweets as we would call them candy uh -huh. and some of those had gone and the stuff you keep in the door pocket had been pulled out and looked through oh yeah and yeah and she kept going she kept adding more things and she said and the back seat had a wet patch on it <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> what could that be? <laughs> and so me and my brother were like, whoa, more and more keeps unraveling here. You started with a candy went missing and now we've got a wet patch on the back seat. <laughs> and, and there was a guy sitting right behind me. <laughs> Oh. Uh, we were laughing so much about this. We 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 kept on riffing on it. We we had we had a like calling Ubers and getting in those Ubers and saying, "That's not where I left my candies. Someone's been in my. Oh wait, it's not my car. Not my car. <laughs> well, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's something. You know, it's just it was how she probably how she noticed things. Huh, it, my well, candies yes. have been moved. Uh, yes. That's been touched. <laughs> There's a wet spot in my back seat. <laughs> I thought it might be a squirrel because because nothing was stolen, oh. apart from the few candies, and it felt like a squirrel might have done that. You know. Uh huh. Well, that's fascinating, and uh, I hope I'm glad that nothing was taken. So. Me and my brother were laughing so hard at the way she told this story. She just kept on adding more and more and bigger and bigger details. You know, from from nothing up to that. The back door was open and there was a wet patch. <laughs> the car wasn't where I parked it. <laughs> Someone else was in the driver's seat. Exactly. I was sitting on a woman's lap. <laughs> that's, that's where we started saying, was it an Uber? <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Let us get down to business. How do we leave Jon Snow? Uh, last we saw of John, he was fending off a wildling attack on the gate with a skeleton crew of fellow Night's Watch brothers atop the wall. After successfully repelling the latest attempt to breach the wall, he retired to his bed for some R&R. &R. He was woken and dragged before Alistair Thorne and Janice Slint. The pair charged him with treason and desertion and planned to fit him with a noose. Uh-oh. Kelly, why don't we provide the summary of this one? Seems prudent at this juncture. Well, John rides down the northern side of the wall in a cage, which is better than the end of a noose. So that's True. something. <laughs> True. Maybe, maybe that's what they meant, you know, a <laughs> noose <laughs> attached to a cage, lowering you slowly. The experience isn't great, but it sure beats the small ice cell he'd come from. 
After Janus Slint sent John away with the plan of hanging him, they shoved him in a cell cut into the base of the wall meant for storing food. He waited for four days until they returned to fetch him. It seems Maester Eamon halted at John's execution by writing to Cotter Pike at Eastwatch, insisting on John's innocence. No worries, Slint and Alistair Thorne have a plan for John to show his loyalty to his brothers. It seems Mance Raider wants to parley, and Slint is sending John as their representative. However, rather than hear terms, John is to kill Mance instead. When the cage reaches the ground, John heads for the wildling camp across the killing field. He's met by Tormund Giantsbane. The wildling leader commends John and his brothers for their fight and is sad to hear of Egret's death. Tormund escorts John to Mance's tent. Harma Dogshead and Vermeer's Sixskins urge Mance to kill John upon seeing him with his Night's Watch black. Instead, Mance sends the rest away and invites John into his tent. There, John discovers Dala being tended to by her sister Val. Dala looks ready to give birth to Mance's child at any minute. Mance explains that, that through Varamir's eagle, who he took over warging from Oral, they know how depleted Castle Black is in both supplies and manpower. John looks around the tent and sees a gigantic horn. Mance says it's the Horn of Winter. He also says that Egret lied to John about them not finding it. John questions why. If they have the Horn of Winter, haven't they used it? Mance says that he has the numbers to get past the wall if he wanted, but that the Night's Watch would bleed his people too much in the process, and his people have bled enough. John is confused. His people haven't suffered that heavy losses in the battle. Man says the losses aren't at the Night's Watch hands. The others grow stronger as it gets colder and darker. So unlike other kings beyond the wall, he isn't there to conquer. He's here with his tail between his legs. He simply wants to hide behind John's wall. That's why they haven't used the horn. If the wall falls, there's nothing left to stop the others. John imagines giants in Winterfell, free folk stealing daughters and wives, etc., and questions whether Mance can control his people enough to keep the king's peace. Mance laughs at that idea. They have no interest in kings or laws or taxes. He's offering a horn, not their freedom. If the Night's Watch refuse, they'll blow the horn in three days. John's mind races. He should kill Mance now, or maybe destroy the horn, or both. But before he can take any action, a different horn is heard in the distance. The men race outside. Through his eagle, Varamir can see men on horses approaching from all directions. Mance and his leaders ride to engage in battle, leaving Varamir to watch John. However, in no time, Varamir is writhing in pain. John sees the eagle burning high in the air. Val emerges from the tent to announce Dalla's labor has begun. John sends her back inside for safety. Battle and chaos is raging all around. Hundreds of men are pouring from the trees. Knights with banners, free riders, men at arms. They're riding over the wildling defenders. Only the giants are finding success. Unlike in the NFL. Uh, <laughs> good. <laughs> I've really stopped watching the NFL. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> the giants are not I, playing well. I'll say that. Uh, but I do know that the Steelers... Do you, um, Mike, Mike... Tomlin? Tomlin? Mm -hmm. has never had a losing season in 17 that, seasons or whatever. That is true. Yeah. Astonishing. Uh, John realizes the fight is done. The wildlings are throwing down weapons and running from the fight. It is then that John sees the largest banners of oil, royal standards. For a moment, John wonders if his brother Rob has returned from the south. However, soon he sees that there are two standards, one yellow with a red heart and the other gold with a prancing black stag. His mind goes to King Robert, until he hears the cries of Stannis, Stannis, Stannis. Stannis! Stannis! <laughs> well, yep, yeah, that was good. I, we needed some I, We needed some action at the wall, and this is good action at the wall. It, it feels like it was stagnating with the battle between the wildlings and the wall. because It was, yes. It wasn't getting anywhere, but this is... Right. Uh... They were deadlocked. Although, I, I will say... The, the John Nine, the arrival of Thorn and Slint was was made that chapter exciting too. But this is this is more momentous for the whole story. I feel yes, very much so. You, the first thing you pointed out when we talked about this was that the cell was five feet by five feet by five feet, which you found to be you thought that would be pure torture. I think that's worse for you than me. I'm pretty sure I could lie across the diagonal of that cell. <laughs> 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 
Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. I could lie horizontally on the floor in that cell. You probably could lie sort of upper corner to lower <laughs> corner, you know. Oh, it, it, the thought of it, it gives me trouble breathing. Just so enclosed like that. Uh, it it doesn't say whether the door is uh, bars or like a wooden door and he's completely closed off in there. You know what it should be? It should be just a block of ice that they cut out, slide out, push him in, <laughs> slide, it, slide back, it back, and then spray it with cold water so it refreezes. <laughs> oh, yeah. That wouldn't help, would it, McKelly? No, it would wouldn't. make it worse. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so just like a sort of ice blue five by five by five block with nothing in it except you. Yeah. And and of course, you could just see the person in there <laughs> banging on the on the ice and pacing. Well, they can't even pace. It's not you can't stand up. <laughs> oh. Break dance. <laughs> oh. oh, man, it would be it's such a hum- inhumane thing to do in general. But to your own Night's Watch brother, I mean, that's that is yeah, something. It, it isn't actually a cell, is it? They, they don't use it. I mean, was it specially used for a cell for John, or has it been used this way before? Because it's it's a, it's a meat cellar, basically, right? Right. To keep yeah. food fresh. They discovered that they can keep meat f- food fresh longer by shoving it in these yeah storage areas in the wall. I I don't think it was specifically designed like John was the first prisoner they've ever thrown in there. They don't really say one way or the other, right? But uh, I'm guessing that it's been used before. But you never know. I mean, Alice yeah, Thorne's involved. Of- yeah, they have all kinds of things they could use. I mean, like the cage he's dangling over the front of the wall in would probably work as well. They could dangle him about like 350 feet up and just let the wildlings fire arrows at him. That is that is an awesome idea because you could really get a sense of where the uh, where the archer's <laughs> range is. You slowly <laughs> lower your enemy into them. Yeah. Or they could do it, make him like a moving target, you know, up and down, and up and down, <laughs> back Swing and forth. Swing me left to right. Swing me left to right. Um, so Slint, Slint does seem to have taken control at the wall and seems to actually be leading um, for better or worse. Yeah, uh, it's just so weird. There's There was like no discussion about it. No letter from Cotter Pike saying in the interim, I'm naming Janus Slint. Uh, you know, interim Lord of Castle Black until, uh, you know, until Bowen Marsh returns. There was no vote. He just showed up and took over. Yeah. And it, it certainly doesn't of... seem that he has any clue who Maester Eamon is. He, right. He thinks to him, he, he says out loud, this blind man with a chain, who does he think he is? Uh, but I was thinking... You would think that Alice or Thorne would know, but maybe that's something that Maester Eamon doesn't broadcast, that he's the brother of King Aegon V. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he doesn't seem like the kind who would go, Hi, I'm Maester Eamon <laughs> Targaryen. <laughs> right. When a new person comes, they say, you know, Tell us a bit about yourself. (laughs) (laughs) I am Maester Aemon. I could have been king. I chose not to because I'm humble. (laughs) I chose this. I'm an idiot. (laughs) Uh, But Uh, uh, it's almost, I found it almost laughable that Slint figured that Mance Raider must be asking for the parlay because Janus Slint is there and he, he must be so scared now that Slint's arrived that he's asking for a parlay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Tormund uh, meets John and he's he's very forgiving of John for his turning of cloak uh, and the deceit that he perpetrated on them all. I do think presumably he was under orders. They probably saw John coming and they sent him out and said, don't let anything happen to him. We want to hear what he's got to say. Yeah. So, yeah. He just like he could have done that and been cold. And yeah, you know, silent toward him, but he was—he seemed kind and understanding when they met, and you know, he was jovial, and you know, he he well, commended them have... on a good job in this battle yeah. so far. I think and... they have a genuine friendship, and and life is hard north of the wall, and you know, stealing daughters and wives is kind of a dumb thing, so harboring grudges against those who've wronged you doesn't seem to be something that's that common and Tormund seems like a pleasant sort of fellow when he's not 
murdering people. Right, right, yes. He does, but he's not murdering people. He mm. even threatens Vermeer if Vermeer touches John with any of his uh, wargs. He says something like, you lay a hand on him and I'll take that shadow skin cloak I've been wanting. So Right. Yeah. But possibly he knew that John had turned his coat black back to black because of Vermeer's eagle eyes. And so, you know, maybe he had time to kind of process it and get over it. And, uh, yeah, you know, one thing about Tormund, it seems like Tormund is one of the few Game of Thrones characters who were actually made younger in the show. Because the description is that he has a white beard. Yeah. Which would indicate, a, you know, a certain age. And I'm pretty sure the actor had did not have. No. White hair, so right? Perhaps a little salt in, in the right. ginger. But right, yes. It was pretty, yes. He was so, a you know, it, young man. In so many instances, the Game of Thrones characters are made older than older, the Song of Ice yeah. and Fire book characters. Here yeah. we have the opposite happening. Yeah. Um, so the wildlings, Varamir actually has, has brought news to the wildlings of the, uh, the situation at Castle Black and how dire it is. Uh, He's walking into Oral's old eagle, which is strange because because he's saying that as he's got a piece of Oral in him now because right. of his walking to his old eagle, and so some of his hatred for John is that because Oral hated John. Um, but it's also interesting that that the Night's Watch didn't look for that eagle because it would have been smart of them to bring that eagle down. Yeah, that's and, and the eagle gets brought down in this chapter. By an easily, arrow. Yes, yes, exactly. So you would think they would... John should... He should have nightmares about this eagle. You would think right. he'd be able to spot that eagle. And right. I know that eagle take him down, you know? Maybe all of the death and wanton destruction at the foot of the wall was to keep the eyes of the Night's Watch pointing downward <laughs> while the eagle surveyed everything going on and reported back. That could back. be it. That, that could be... It was all just a diversion tactic. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was... You know, what we discover is that they know, Mance knows how depleted the Night's Watch is. And we had discussed that before, that at least the Wildlings didn't know how short of supplies and how short of brothers they were. So they wouldn't know, like, we've only got four casks left to drop on them. And then after those four casks, we're pretty much out of everything. Right. And so at least they had, the Night's Watch had that going for them. But it turns out they didn't even have that going for them. Right. So right, which makes you wonder. So Slint and Thorn claim that Mance wants to parlay. Right. Why would he at this point, given what he knows? Ah, uh, I guess. Why not do it sooner? I guess. May yes. Well, there's definitely that question. Why? Why fight at all? That we can. Uh, get mm. to when we get to all that stuff but yeah i i guess he figures they're out of ammo they can't keep this now, up that's true now's the time to talk to them because they may actually say yes to this right because they they don't have a leg to stand on yeah that's very true you know one thing i found fascinating from Vermeer's six skins was this rule that we'd not heard of before that once a beast is joined with a man any skin changer can slip inside him I think that's a new rule that we're learning here. Ah. Which, but, but but did he implicitly mean if that beast loses its skin changer? He didn't say that, but yeah. maybe that's what he meant. Because I was thinking, does that mean that Vermeer could control Ghost and Go uh, and John could control that shadow cat that was? Well, John didn't do a very good job of controlling the eagle when it was tearing his face <laughs> up. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I wondered if maybe. <laughs> The Starks and their direwolves are more than just warg and animal. There's some sort yeah. of extra special connection because uh, I just found that the idea that Vermeer could have just gone in and controlled Ghost at any point. Yeah. I, I, I find that hard to believe. <laughs> find it. <laughs> Sorry, I just made myself laugh here. No, that's not how warging works. <laughs> 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 But if if you do add the 
if that animal loses its skin changer, it is open to adoption by other skin changers. Then it makes a lot more sense. That does make a lot more sense. Otherwise, yes, the whole thing would just be a free for all all the time. You know? <laughs> right, stealing each riding, other's wargs. <laughs> you'd be riding the snow leopard, and suddenly it would eat you. you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, skin changers would be playing pranks on each other, you know. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, one, one thing that happens right as John walks into the tent, he sees Val and Dala. And he says to Val that he was sorry that Jarl fell. And uh, Val responds, he always climbed too fast. And that was kind of all she had to say. I don't know how she knew that he was dead prior to that. I guess because the gate wasn't open, she could assume he failed in, you know, Jarl, uh, Steer and all the raiders that were supposed to open the gate must have died in battle. And John didn't give it away. He just said, I'm sorry, he's dead. He said, I'm sorry. I was sorry when Jarl fell. Oh, uh, so, so... I see. You're, you're not saying it's weird that she knew that he fell. She knew that he fell because John just said it. But it's the fact that she took his news of his death that quickly in her stride. Yes. Very casually. Like, eh, he always climbed too fast. Yeah. You know? Like, I told her. She, she, she might have assumed he was dead or might have assumed he's captured. Right, right. She just reacted like, meh, meh, he always climbed too fast. Well, that I makes that sense. a little odd. Didn't yeah. seem too shocked or interested in learning the details. Like, oh, is that how he died? He fell. And I... nobody, nobody from that raiding party got back, right? Nobody. No, they all went over the wall. I think in that chapter, I remember questioning what happened to all the horses that they left behind. So I don't think there were people that stayed on the north side of the wall. What from it that was group. was. One of the horses was a warg. Ah, that's what it was. One of the guys who got killed. <laughs> and now Varamir got in there and said, what happened? Oh, he climbed real fast and fell. Yeah. Fell. That's what it was. Of course, to a horse, pretty much any speed climbing the wall would look fast. Yes, it would. Like, no way I can do that. Anyway, I just so, thought it was a, that she'd have more of a reaction to learning that uh, her They're wildlings died. and they're tough, but I do take your point. That does yeah. feel a little bit cold even for a wildling. Yeah. She did say um, he was nothing but a uh, plaything to her, but I don't know how true that actually was. Yeah, but I, I mean, I get more upset if I lost a plaything. <laughs> <laughs> so according to the notes here, Mance has a giant horn. Uh, I see, and he says that it's the horn of winter. Um, now, Igrit denied this. She said that they never found it while they were looking for it in the frost fangs. Mance explains this to John by saying, "Well." She lied to you. I didn't actually trust you. I'm not an idiot. Um, yeah. It does make a lot of sense to lie to John, I'll have to say. but It does. Agreed. But then, if you didn't trust John, none of your other actions made, make a lot of sense. Because you sent him over the wall with your grit and company, and he got word to Castle Black that probably made the difference between success and failure of the Wildlings' attack on Castle Black. Right, yeah. Why would you have sent him if you didn't actually trust him right so there's an alternative explanation here which is mance is lying that yeah that could be uh, certainly mance wasn't there at the top of the wall when egret said to john we didn't find the horn of winter to bring this wall down she was pretty upset she it didn't seem she was he thought she was crying because she was so exhausted from climbing. And he said, she said, it's not about that. It's that we didn't find the horn to bring this wall down. It did not feel like a lie to me. She was exasperated about it. Yeah. Uh, of course, possibly she was not in the know. Although given the size of the thing, it would seem like pretty much everyone would know that thing was found. You know, <laughs> Right. Eight foot long horn. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so it's possible that upper management lied to the rest to keep it a secret. Or she lied to John. Or But I agree I agree with you. Thinking back on that scene, it didn't feel like she was lying to him. I agree. Or that's not the horn of winter. It's right. gotta be one of those three things, right? But 
It's all right, so let's go with the last of those. It's not the Horn of Winter. It's just a big old horn that they're pretending is the Horn of Winter to threaten to bring down the wall. It's right. a great fake, great idea, because, I mean, first of all, the thing's gargantuan. It probably could blow the wall down, even if it isn't the Horn of Winter. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are faking, why not go the extra mile that John asks for, which is promising that the wildlings will behave themselves once they go south of the wall? If, that if is you're an... trying, yes, because because John's going to resist if you can't promise that. Promise it, empty promise. You're already lying about the Horn of Winter. One more little fib is not going to change things. But it, right. it might change things. It might make John go back and say, you know what, I, I agree with you. Let's open the let's open the gates. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That is, uh, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Why, mm. if he was lying about this. Why would he not just lie about will behave? Why not in general just lie about behaving when they get on the other side of the wall? Right. You know exactly. Yeah, they, yeah. they feel pretty desperate here. Why not just? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We King's Peace. We're yeah, all yeah. about King's taxes. You Scouts on everybody. Scouts <laughs> on <honor>. Yeah, <laughs> right. The other thing is, it is a terrific bargaining position to have a weapon that can never be used that you're willing to trade. Uh huh. That's right. Because you can't test it. Yeah, last like, one through the gate hands over the horn of winter. Like, hey, right, whatever yeah. you do, don't blow that. Don't thing. blow it. You don't want to blow your wall down. You got to trust me. It is what I say. It is. All right, Sam. I want you to go down to Storm's End and give this a little toot. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> so, Mant says that he, he's got such a big force of wildlings that he could attack in multiple places and still have enough people at each place for success. And one specific idea that he throws out there that he could do if he if he really wanted to was he could send 10,000 wildlings on rafts across the Bay of Ice to take Eastwatch by the sea from the southern side. And yeah, he probably could spare 10,000 people to go do that. I just was thinking about that, and I wondered... Would Eastwatch be equipped to handle such a thing, being that they're a, a seafaring naval operation? They have ships and such. If, yes, if I was the commander of Eastwatch by the sea, I would have some kind of defenses against 10,000 people coming around by the sea on rafts. Right. And Mans Raider, as a former member of the Night's Watch, would know about that, I would imagine. You would think. So maybe that's why he hasn't done it. <laughs> Possibly, yes. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you would think that rafts would be pretty easy to squash, even if there were 10,000 of them for a naval base like Eastwatch by the Sea. Yeah. You know? 10,000 yeah, is a lot, you know, no doubt. First of all, getting 10,000 rafts into the water might get someone's attention. That's true. Sitting on top of the wall, I mean, looking out. Do you remember yesterday when there was a forest over there? <laughs> <laughs> do, you th- do you think the wildlings might have had something to do with that? <laughs> that might be just how the conversation goes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Didn't we oh, have I'm a lot of we manned trees? this wall after all? <laughs> yeah. Man says he doesn't want to attack in multiple places like that because they would bleed too much. But he, he actually, he's talking about the bleeding, not from the battles that they would have to fight with the Night's Watch, but more from the others. But I wonder about that because it feels like the, we've, we've bumped into others sporadically in the North, but we haven't seen a concerted force of them yet. And you'd think that if they were like picking off the stragglers of Mance's army, that Mance wouldn't be camped in front of this wall. All 100,000 of them would be scrambling up it, you know? Right. Yes. You, you would think so there'd just be a... Feel like, it feels like the threat is still kind of like vague at the moment, not specific. Right. right. There, There is not the desperation that you might expect in this situation if the others were like, 
on right hot on their heels exactly. yes exactly yeah exactly. It, it is it is very kingly of him to consider the lives lost in the equation for success well to be honest given the state of the kings of the seven kingdoms it's not in the <laughs> least bit kingly to do that i was, just, Go I was on. gonna say i i don't think the previous king of the seven kingdoms would care <laughs> so much about the uh the cost of the loss loss of life um but is he is he right to be holding back like this? Like like you were saying, he knows what's coming. I feel like the desperation might cause him to do whatever's necessary to save as many people as he can, and if that requires attacking the wall at different points along the wall, and uh, you know some some people dying because of it, uh, uh, be what it requires. I'm going to go with he's he's painting a story to explain his actions, but the real story is. He's going. He thinks that the that the Night's Watch will let him through because of the Horn of Winter, and so he doesn't need to do this. This is like, let's all gather here because we're going to be going through that tunnel later this yeah, week. Yeah, sure, that makes sense. That makes sense. But you know that. So he talks about his tail between his legs, and we were just talking about it's not quite the desperation we would expect. And another example of it is the fact that he won't even consider adhering to the rules of the seven kingdoms in return for passage south of the wall like which is it which which is worse for you staying north of the wall and being picked off by others or having to pay taxes maybe he feels he can't speak for the the wildlings in that particular instance could be but maybe as the wildlings file through the wall one by one they could all sort of like you know take a chit Chit says, behave yourself. You know, right. be, if if you won't take the chit and you don't come through, you know. <laughs> yeah. Then it's your individual decision. It's not man's telling you you have to kneel. It's your choice. Right. As, a, as an yes. individual wildling. Sure. Yeah. It, it, it's a real conundrum for the Night's Watch and, and John being the face of the Night's Watch here in this, in, in this uh, conversation with Mance. Because if they do nothing, they leave these tens of thousands of of humans to of, die of, fu- of future whites <laughs> yes and, and even if they didn't reanimate just leaving them to die at the hands of the others is bad enough but then they're gonna reanimate and add to the ranks of the whites like you just said right or you let them through and create chaos in your realm and you know that's but, not great but, either but uh, we've already hypothesized this before the the deal is your fighting age men join us on the wall. Your 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 sure. your old your young your women can go farm take whatever they need to survive, but the fighting age men stay with us and fight on the wall. You know how bad this threat is. Help us right. defend it. You yes, know? yes. And that's the tax. There's no tax. It the tax is you help us. Yeah. But the, yeah, it, it, are you thinking life sentence? Are you thinking like no? Until I, I a threat has t- been I extinguished. I said this at the time. You you because the whole thing is temporary. When winter recedes, you all go back north of the wall. Right. Yeah. Nobody's. I mean, you can stay in the night's watch if you want, but then you got to take the vow. But you're not. You're not forced to stay. Huh. Everyone can go back. Right. You know, it felt like John seemed to consider the idea if they were willing to uphold the king's peace. He said to him, are you a true king? Can you rule your friends? Can you get them to adhere to the king's peace? And Mance made it very clear they had no interest in rules or laws or taxes of the seven kingdoms. So, yeah, uh, it'd be hard to overlook that from the Night's Watch perspective and from John's right. perspective Which is here. why I can't understand why Mance can't bring himself to just say, you know, hey, can't speak for all of them, but yes, in general, we'll, we'll behave ourselves, you know. Right. Well, now we'll see if, uh, you know, <laughs> things are slightly different than they were when they had this conversation at the end of the right. chapter. So maybe they'll be more willing to to agree it, it, now. Yeah. Mans could say, when Stannis says, you've got to bend the knee, Mans will say, well, they really don't want me to. Could you ask around? You know, take a <laughs> show of hands here. <laughs> Uh, so John is really considering the assassination attempt, which obviously would be pretty suicidal. But yes, right as he is thinking about that, the uh, the battle arrives, so it sort of saves him. Um, I do think, though, that he should 
he should he should actually have been taking the offer back because the offer is still okay. If he said, look, man's can't promise they'll behave themselves, but as we've said many times, it's a hundred thousand whites or it's a problem on the other side of the wall. Take your pick. Yeah. I guess it depends on how much of a threat a hundred thousand whites are on the north side of the wall. Well, if you leave them with that horn of winter. Oh, true. Yes, you might want to take that with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know how White's lungs work. Maybe they... <laughs> <laughs> that could be a problem. Right, right, right. Yeah. So I'll say it's a bold decision of Stannis to ride west from Eastwatch, north of the wall. Yeah. He had to make a decision is. at the I outset about that. there. Yeah. And he made the decision to be north of the wall. Um, it would be very cold and in shadow constantly because we've talked about how long that shadow, that, that, that wall casts. Oh, right, right. Yes, you have. And you would be very unsure of the welcome that you'd receive. You you know, the the rumours of how big Mance's army at Eastwatch, those rumours must have been through the roof. Quarter of a million. Yeah. Right, yeah. I was just going to say that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he didn't know what he was going to face. But it was the right side to be on, because if he'd been on the other side, he couldn't really have helped here. They're all coming down that cage one by one with arrows flying at them. (laughs) Right. They've they've blocked the gate so they can't get through the gate so they can have as many thousands of knights as they want on the southern side of the wall. And it really wasn't going to do much good in this situation. Horse scrambling down the wall and Varimir's six skins saying, told you. (laughs) Or at least his horse was anyway. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah you're right i mean they could take as long as they want filtering through the gate at east watch you know they could filter right. however many we don't we never get a, a number well, of they could their just army jump on the size rafts. but oh yeah that's right <laughs> take the rafts across <laughs> but uh during the battle john sees the heavy horse hears the trumpets and thinks this is this is like a serious army here. And he thinks to himself, could it be Rob returning north? And it just reminded me that he doesn't know that Rob's dead. When he, he got doesn't? back. No, when, uh... when he got back to Castle Black, I went back and checked because I was like, why is he thinking that? He was only told of Bran and Rickon's death when right. he got back to Castle Black. So Would, would Slint and... No, Slint and Thorn wouldn't know either. They've been on a boat since right. long before Rob died. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's now, funny. When he said that, I thought he was discounting it because he was like, no, stupid, Rob's dead. But he didn't say that because he, had, he doesn't know it. Mm. Right. Now, someone who does know it is Stannis. So if, ah. he, if he gets to talk with Stannis, he might learn of Rob's death. Um, do we see any houses of note in amongst Stannis' men? He mentions three sigils that he doesn't know what they are. He sees a seahorse, a field of birds, and a ring of flowers. And based on who I know is in Stannis' camp, the seahorse is obviously House Valerian. Valerian, I knew that one. Yes. And then the field of birds, House Karen has, a, their sigil is black nightingales on a yellow field. And it, I think it's Vermeer that mentions how much yellow he sees. So that, that uh, would yeah. fit yeah. as well. Of course, most of those yellow standards are for Stannis, but. Yes, true. Uh, yeah. And then the Ring of Flowers, House Florent, their sigil is a fox head circled by blue flowers. So that sounds like a ring yes, of flowers yes, yes, to me. Yes. So why is Stannis here? Right? <laughs> why is Stannis here? <laughs> it, it certainly seems like the letter that Davos was reading with Maester Pylos when he was learning to read must be the letter that he read to Stannis while Stannis was standing over him, holding Lightbringer, about to lop his head off. Oh, yeah. Bring that a little closer, could you? Yes, thanks. Right. <laughs> now, why did this letter sway Stannis to forgo his attempts to win the Iron Throne and instead sail to the end of the world? That I, well, I hope so, that's rhetorical, McKelly, because I need you here. Okay. Well, so that letter that Davos read... It spoke of Mormont's defeat at the Fist of the First Men and wildlings possibly taking control of the wall. Now, we were, you might recall that Stannis spoke of seeing a battle in the flames, and the description fits 
the battle at the Fist of the First Men pretty well. He did, yes, I remember that. Yeah. So, possibly he, or Melisandre, someone has put these things, connected these things, and Stannis feels like since he saw that image in the flames, he must be meant to be involved in some way. Right. So, okay. you know, and possibly and also I, that he wants to show that he's the true king. He will come yes. and stop this threat from the north while the Lannisters sit there, a little boy king on the Iron Throne and do nothing. A little bit of PR. Never goes, never, never a bad idea. Right. Nobody seems to want to do PR. Maybe Stannis mm-hmm. is going to be the first. <laughs> um, who wrote the letter? Is it from Maester Eamon? Well, it says the, when we'd heard about it, it said it was from Bowen Marsh. But oh, it's from Bowen Marsh. It must have been Maester Eamon that wrote the letter. Although maybe Bowen Marsh, he's the Lord Steward. Maybe he yeah, does yeah. know how to write, and uh, you know, maybe he wrote it himself. But okay. the the Lannisters were concerned last chapter that Stannis was going to go to Sunspear because of Oberyn Martell's death at the hands of the Mountain. I think maybe he would have, but surely he left Dragonstone before news of. Uh, the trial by combat reached him because it would it would be a bit of a trip to get from Dragonstone Quite. to here. Quite. So, well, why don't you give us some background, McKelly? Sure. Well, so Mance mentions that other kings beyond the wall came south to conquer, whereas he came with his tail between his legs. Whether he actually did or not is debatable, I guess. Uh, one king he mentioned was Raymond Redbeard. And like most kings beyond the wall, Raymond united the wildling clans under him. And in 226, he noticed a decline in numbers and an increase in laxness of the Night's Watch and took the opportunity to attack. Using pretty much the same method that John and company did when they scaled the wall, you know, initial climbers getting up there, then throwing down ladders and everyone else coming up, he managed to get a pretty sizable army of wildlings over the wall. The army began to wreak havoc on the southern side of the wall, causing Lord Willem Stark to march to meet them along with Lord Harmon Umber. The clash happened along the shores of Long Lake. During the battle, Raymond killed Willem Stark, but then Raymond was in turn killed by Willem's younger brother, Artos Stark. Raymond's sons were also killed in the battle, but his younger brother, who was called Red Raven, managed to escape and make it back north of the wall. Where was the Knights watching all of this? Well... They were asleep at the wheel, pretty much. By the time they showed up to the fight, it was already over. And Artos Stark, a.k.a. Artos the Implacable, by the way, mm-hmm. ordered that the Night's Watch dispose of the dead, and the Night's Watch Lord Commander, whose name is Jack Musgood, was dubbed Sleepy Jack afterward. Uh, this attack here by Raymond Redbeard was the last major wildling threat to the Wall until this current attempt by Mance. Interesting. Interesting. So so it feels like they have to gather together before they really attack the wall. The sort of like clan by clan, they don't bother attacking the wall. They see it as too sure, wall. Sure, right. Once needs they to are be, under... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it needs to be a king to unite them all. Yeah. So, uh, comparison with the television show, this was more similar than I'd remembered. In fact, I, I, I barely remembered that Stannis... I, I remember Stannis came north, but I didn't really remember the whole attacking the wildlings north of the wall. It just passed me by. Uh-huh. But... Um, John does go out to parlay with Mance, but there's no sense in the TV show of him being sent on a suicide mission. Like, he's not told. We don't, at least I couldn't find a scene where he's told to go north of the wall and talk to Mance. He just goes. Right. Um, He's disarmed, but keeps his eye on the potato peeler that he thinks he might skewer him with. Uh, No, (laughs) no Dalla and Val. So uh, that aspect of the story was dropped completely uh, right there's no dalla and val no in dalla no val, as far show at all um i i don't think so um and there's no horn of winter oh, okay but much less other, negotiating power there right less negotiating power but he but but he does say he he has a different threat he has sent a large force over the wall four miles east They've climbed the wall and they're going to attack Castle Black from behind. And uh. he, yeah. And so he feels like it's going to fall to them anyway. So they should let them through now. Many of I the ha- things they talk about are very similar. I have to say, I feel for you because that must have been confusing trying to keep that bit Heck and yes. the actual book. Heck yes. 
a cannon the, the, separate the in your worst head. part is when i read what happened on the tv show which i often oh. do because it's very hard to find the scene so i have to use resources to find which scenes to go look for and then i'll read the scene before i watch it but now it's in my head that i read it and now right. yeah, it. Um, um, that's why one then, of us does it so that i can <clears throat> tell you when when you got the right. two confused um but but yes, then Stannis arrives and uh, Mance doesn't have an opportunity to kill John, although he's certainly thinking about it, uh, <laughs> and accuses John of being in on the plot. But John's like, I do not know who these people are, you know. Ah, uh, right. right. Um, um, pedantry corner. I don't have any pedantry about this chapter in particular, um, but there's pedantry against my, one of my own theories. So one oh, of my own theories okay. for... Um, the randomness of duration and frequency of the winters was that they are actually caused by giant volcanoes north of the wall that spew out dust cl- and, you know, it blocks the sun for months on end or years on end. Yeah, I remember. The, yeah. I thought it was a good theory. In this chapter, it is mentioned that the days are getting shorter. It is, right. Well, a volcano wouldn't do that. Yeah, that's a good point. That is a tilt of the Earth's axis. Yeah. Huh. Well, okay. I see your point. Yeah. So. Fair point. Uh, I mean, it is possible, of course, that it's a combination of those things. And we did talk about the fact that the the Earth's tilt, our Earth's tilt, does vary marginally. And if this planet's tilt varied more, it could be random and hard to predict. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. could I still be it. that. Good stuff. News and notes. Well, it so it's recently been revealed in the new book Oppenheimer inside Christopher Nolan's explosive atomic age thriller written by Jada Yuan that uh, Nolan rented out none other than George Martin's train, which is called oh. Sky Railway, to film several scenes in the movie Oppenheimer. Huh. Well, actually, it, can I can I can I interject? You know your celebrity lookalike. Who is my celebrity lookalike? Come on, who's your celebrity lookalike? Well, uh, I've had people say I look like Corey Stoll, but I don't think that's who you mean. Oh, that's good, actually. I had never thought of that. That's that's actually better than most. Um, <laughs> no, this is one that you've been told, and you. I believe your reaction was, I'll take that! Oh, Yes! <laughs> Chatham Tanning. Tanning Channing Tatum, that's his name. Channing nope. Tatum. No? Nope. Not even that one. Mr. Emily Blunt. Oh, yeah. What what's uh... John Krasinski, right? Yes, I was gonna call him Jim Halpert. John Krasinski, Jim Halpert, yes. right. Yes, right. <laughs> um he was in a show, a movie called Leatherheads or something like that. Yes. About American football. Yes, he was. There was a scene on a train in that, and that train is in Salisbury, North Carolina, and I've ridden on it since that oh, movie was made. So wow. Okay. Look that was you. why that came up. <laughs> well, anyway, back to Oppenheimer. Uh, it seems that they, they covered up the A Song of Ice and Fire theme decor to make them the cars of the train look more like typical 1940s train cars. Uh, and then they just took the trip back and forth, which is about 40 minutes from Santa Fe to Lamy, New Mexico, uh, shooting their scenes. So, yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. I, I would love it if they would have just left one for us to look for in the movie. Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Little Easter egg in there. Yeah. Just a crown stag somewhere hiding. <laughs> um, so you were telling me that our Ghost of Harrenhal merchandise site uh, has caught fire. Uh, Dan's new design with the microphone and the raven. Uh, yes. Flying off the shelves. That's they awesome. Have. That's, that's great. Uh so uh, fill fill your Christmas goodie bags with stuff from there if you want. Uh, Ghosts of Threadless dot com. We have some great deals right now, yeah. Just yeah, for, for the holidays. The, for the holidays, yeah, a lot of really great Perfect. deals. So check it out right now. I think t shirts are like thirteen dollars, which is sweet, pretty <clears> good deal. And as as I was saying before, it is U S Thanksgiving, and I was thinking of what I'm grateful for, and it is. The people that we have as listeners and friends on this show uh, are absolutely. what I'm most grateful for in the world. Right in our lives, immeasurable. So yes. thank you all very much. What he said. Thank you all. Thank you so much. All right, let's conclude this one. Um, 
we are getting near the end, aren't we? Yeah. This, I, this behemoth of a book is almost behind us, McKelly. I know. I, I noticed uh, yesterday, I think it was, that we're inside of 100 pages left, at least on my yeah. my e-reader version. We've got seven chapters and the epilogue left. That's oh, it. You know what? We are exactly 100 pages in my paperback. Okay. We are on the... page 1027. We're 100 oh, wow. left to go. Yeah. I think we're on page 966 or something like that oh, of my very similar e-reader. Sounds. Yeah. 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 Um, and so much has happened to John. You know, he's been a hero. He's been he's been lover. He's been a fighter. He's been he's accused five of... by five by five cage. <laughs> <laughs> accused of treason. Was uh, <laughs> was was supposed to be hung to death. All all manner of things. He lost and ghost. Pres- presumably, he's going to be midwife to. Uh, Dallas baby is next on the right. list. Yeah, the chapter ended with after he heard the Stannis, 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 he turned around and went back into the tent. Exactly. I, I do fear a bit for Dalla. I mean, there, there was no midwife. That's Val, her sister, said, I need to find the midwife. And John said, you're the midwife. Get back in there because you're right. not going anywhere out here. It's chaos. And we know how caring she is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 at least Jarl, maybe she uh, was like, yeah, <laughs> I didn't really care for him that much anyway, if I'm being she, honest. She comes out like five minutes later, no blood on her, and she's like, oh, she died in childbirth. Well, you know, <laughs> told her. Uh, um, Stan has arrived just in time to save John. Um, it is possible that he could knock some heads together here. I mean, if he, you know, again, the only solution, as we've said for three books now, is to invite the wildlings through the wall. And maybe yeah. Stannis can cut through this Gordian knot and make that happen. Yeah, it's all about getting them to follow the rules of the Seven Kingdoms. You, know, you come into this new land, there are, are rules that. But, you're but even to not follow. even that, because 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 you're not going to make them full citizens of the Seven Kingdoms. You don't have to follow. They don't have to follow the rules in the same way. Carve out something for them temporarily. Let them yeah, have that. Sure. The gift and, and the that, new gift. The, Exactly. Within the gift and the new gift, you can house all those wildlings and they would barely crowd the people that are there. Don't molest those people. Yeah, if they can get them to and agree to that. go home when we tell you to. Yeah, it's just, it's hard to, once they're on that side, I guess it's hard to assure that they I, will do as they agreed. I think, yeah, and I think it's hard for the Southerners, by Southerners I mean everybody's half of the wall, right. to understand that the wildlings want to go home. Yeah, and it's also... There is a perception that they want to get south of the wall forever, always. That the wall is the only thing keeping them from coming south 24-7. But the wildlings actually want to live north of the wall. They're just coming south to shelter from the others. Yeah, yeah. And it, But it's also hard for people south of the wall to understand why the Night's Watch would let them through. To, to believe that the Snarks and the Grumpkins... Are a real threat that yeah that they need to be protected from, but the Night's Watch know it, and Stannis obviously knows it to a certain extent. That's why he's come. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, you know, now that speaking of Stannis being there, now that he's on, he's run over, uh, Mance's force. It seems pretty likely Mance is going to lose possession of the Horn. Right. Well, will like we were talking about earlier. Will that be enough? to get them to do as agreed upon, you know, agree upon whatever roles they're going to agree upon for these right, people coming right. through. You lost your bargaining chip. Right. Yeah. So will also, will Stannis shake up things at Castle Black? Uh, John's going to need leadership. It. John needs that to happen for sure. Yes. Yeah. But uh, uh, he has no, he probably barely knows Janice Slint. I mean, although they must have overlapped, but Slint's Slint's elevation to what he was in King's Landing happened after Stannis had left. Yeah, I'm sure he knows of him. Uh, I'm sure he's been in meetings where Janus Slint has has come to give some sort of report on what's going on in the city or the gold cloaks. I think way back in way back in the day, uh, we were told that Stannis once tried to ban prostitution in the city of. I'm sure the oh, yeah. the commander of the gold cloaks had to hear about that, you know. Mm, good point. <laughs> so I'm I'm sure there is a, some sort of discussion or some sort of interaction 
hopefully he knows what a I don't know what's a good what's a good British term for what Janice Slint is. You, you guys have the there good are, terms. <laughs> there aren't any that are PG enough for the podcast. Okay. <laughs> what a uh, lick spittle? Can we say a lick is spittle? That is very, that's a very yeah. nice word. It's not necessarily yeah. perfectly apt in this situation, but it, it's a great word. Yeah. It is. <laughs> anyway, is hopefully he knows in... that about Slint. What what kind of person Slint is? Is my point? Yeah. It's, it says here in the notes that Stannis gets a reunion with his family, but who? Who are you talking about? Well. So he gets a reunion with his great great uncle because his Stannis's grandmother was Rael Targaryen, Targaryen, daughter of Aegon the Fifth, who was niece to Maester Aemon. There so, you go. How about that? I, I'm not sure either we'll see it that way, considering his brother Robert overthrew the Targaryen dynasty. Uh, you know. But you know, yeah. but they they could put the it's family, you know. If you could you know what? put politics aside, maybe they could talk about if the Stannis- weather. If Stannis was aware, you could definitely, <laughs> you could definitely uh, say, "Hey, I know my family killed all your family, but we're family too." Right. Just that one branch killed the other branch. Right. Exactly. You know, we're just <laughs> blood wise. We're just as close. We just don't have your last name. Right. Uh, and on the subject of blood, um, I am worried about Mance's blood. Remember oh, that he. I liked Mance, that tie in there. Is well, is a king. <laughs> And remember, three leeches of a king's bastard's blood killed three kings. Right. What could you do with a whole man's raider? Yeah. Yeah. You could, re- it, you could rebuild the wall. You blow the wall down and rebuild it. I guess. If they consider a wildling a king at all, you know, that might be That's his saving grace. And also, you know, last we saw of Mance, he was being overrun by mounted knights. So his horse had a spear through its chest uh, so it's possible yes, Mance could be dead yeah 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 we saw that Harma dog's head Harma's head was on a spear being kind of swung right, around right. and mocking you know mocking her dog's head standard are you willing to bet that Melisande's come this time <laughs> it would be really dumb for Stannis if he left her at home this time <laughs> Because basically he regretted not taking her to the uh, to the Blackwater, right? So I, yes. I assume she's there this time. Uh, mm-hmm. I would think so too. Yes. All right. And next week we have Arya. Yes, she uh, she and the Hound make it back to the inn at the crossroads where they meet two old enemies and one long lost friend. So wait, she's not the one with Steel Shanks Walton? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> that we were told that was Arya Stark, right? <laughs> Apparently. Okay. Maybe, maybe an Arya POV will clear that one up for us. All right. Hopefully. There's four ways that you could help us. You could leave us a five-star rating and a positive review. There's no better way to spread the word. You can buy some merchandise, take advantage of the new uh, sigil and the uh, deals that we've got for the holidays at ghostofharrenhall.threadless.com. You could buy us a cup of Arbor Gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghostharrenhall and become a sustainer at one of the many levels available to you. Or you could just donate directly to our cause through our website, ghostsofharrenhall.buzzsprout.com. And if you're looking for more ways to interact with us, keeping up on the latest Ghosts of Heron Hall news and developments, well, you can check us out on our social medias. You can follow us on Twitter, at Ghost Heron Hall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.